Howdy. So, um, like you said, I'm Anna Byerly from Texas A&M. I'm presenting on behalf of myself, my colleague John Mander, and our uh, students who worked on this project, Judong Lee and Cody McKee. So, um, I'll be pre presenting about pretension bent caps to improve substructure design and performance. So this was a project that was sponsored by the Texas Department of Transportation, so I want to give a, a quick history of how we got to this project. So in the 1990s, TxDOT began to use precast bent caps for uh, accelerated bridge construction to uh, speed up the, the, the time of construction over some major highways, uh, but it was also used over some waterways as a means to reduce the time workers spent out um, working in uh, hazardous conditions. And so their, their use of that was popular with the contractors, and so um, f they took some of these unique designs and wanted to standardize the design so it could be used um, a lot throughout Texas. So that led to a research project around 2000 that focused on developing precast uh, connections for these bent caps. These were reinforced concrete bent caps. Um, and that led to a standard that was, uh, that's available from TxDOT and is used a lot. Uh, and then in about the past 10 years or so, contractors started saying to TxDOT, hey, instead of just pre-casting these, can we make these pre-cast pre-stressed and have quality control from a pre-stressed plant? So TxDOT did a couple uh, unique designs for those, but then they wanted to pull this into their standards as well, and that's where we came into play. Uh, they wanted to see some experimental tests to, to see that the bent caps were indeed performing how they were hoping they were performing. So the objective of our project was to enable TxDOT use of pretensioned precast bent caps through a co comprehensive investigation, including experimental ver uh, verification. So uh, first to develop a design procedure and also to relook at the connections they were using to see if there was a better option when we're pre-stressing these bent caps. And then the third item there in gray, I'm not going to be talking about in this presentation, but we looked at the use of interior voids to reduce the weight of these. And I'll be talking about that in the second session um, after lunch. So we spent a while looking at a few different ways to approach the design. Uh, of these to optimize their performance and not not just to look at the the limits we designed for but also to look at what made the most sense for the typical text dot bridge what was going to be the most efficient design procedure for that and what we settled on was the, the the best way to start was to start designing based on the dead load and so with that limit state, we specified that there should be no tension anywhere in the bent cap. And this would uh, ensure that if some cracks did happen by chance, when there was higher loads on the bridge, when the live loads were removed, those cracks would close. Um, and that would therefore help extend the life of the structures. So then at service, we designed, uh, after selecting the number of strands for the dead load, we could specify the concrete strength to ensure that there was no cracking at service, and that's this we found to be the most efficient design procedure. So for the pocket, uh, for the connection, on the left, this is showing the type of tech, uh, connection TxDOT has been using for the past several decades, and that's called a grouted vertical duct connection. And so TxDOT's version is on the bottom left column there, um, and what they do is they have dowel bars coming out of the the columns, these are number 11 bars, they'll have six of them for a, um, a three-foot column, and then th those uh, ducts slip over the bars and that's filled in with grout. Uh, another version of that is to extend the column bars, that's what's shown on the top left, and grout those. So uh, there was an NCHRP uh, project that looked at developing a pocket connection, which is to take all the bars that are extended out of the column and just enclose them in one big duct of concrete. And so we kind of uh, were inspired by that and did a modified pocket connection for TxDOT so that they could use their six dowel bars still, which are more concentrated. This was also beneficial for the pre-stressed concrete because if we had used the full pocket connection, they would be concerned about those thin walls and uh, what that meant when we went from reinforced concrete to pre-stressed concrete. 
So this is showing just a, uh, a real quick overview of our construction pro process. Uh, it worked very well. Uh, there was uh, no concerns with tolerance um, because we had a lot of leeway within our modified pocket connection. So when we brought these into the lab, we already had the column in place. We basically picked them up off the truck, set them down, and five minutes later we were off to class. Um, so it was, it was very eff effective in that sense. So what we did for our experimental test program was uh, many bent cap tests that have been done before are only looking at the negative moment region in a bent. Um, but we wanted to look at both the negative and the positive region. So what we did, what's shown on the top left here, is a three column bent. It has indeterminate demands. And so what we did was we um, pulled this out, a sub assembly of this, we, we terminated it at the inflection point between the exterior and interior column, and then at a similar point in the column. So we were then loading it with what's labeled there as, I don't know if you can see, you can't see my pointer. Um, what's labeled there as P1 and P2 on the bottom drawing are simulating the girder loads. What's labeled on the right side as V and HT are uh, simulating the shear and axial forces at the inflection point, and then we have uh, a force at the bottom of the column too to simulate um, the column shear. So ultimately we did six tests with this program, but three of them were with voids, so I'm not showing those here. So what we did was we did a reinforced concrete bent cap as a reference and then two pre-stressed concrete. The only difference between the two pre-stressed concrete was the spacing of the shear reinforcement. So the right figure here is showing us a cross section at the pocket. So what we did to avoid congestion of the reinforcement at the pocket was we put all the strands along the side and then just a couple up against the pocket to help keep it in place. And this, this avoided any congestion uh, as we placed, placed this. So we subjected this to a lot of loads. Um, most of it was what we call pattern A, and that's replicating the demands that are in the bridge. So we basically increased the girder loads from zero up to the maximum of our actuators, which was 600 kips. So that's like a 300 uh, kip uh, reaction on girder from each side. And we did dead loads, uh, the design uh, strength one um, demands, which we're calling ULS, the service one, that those are out of order, uh, but SLS, and then we were able to go to 140% beyond the design loads before we ran out of actuator capacity. At that point, we hadn't failed these spent caps. Um, they were large, full scale, so three and a half foot square. Um, so then what we did was we started modifying the load patterns so that we could try and trigger failure. So we maximized the positive moment, did some joint opening and closing tests, then we maximized the negative, and then we just pulled and pushed with the actuators the best we could until we could get failure. So if we look at it with the what we're calling the bridge demand pattern, what reflects what's in the actual structure, the left here is showing the reinforced concrete specimen, and the right is showing the pre-stressed concrete specimen. Right here, this is service loads. Uh, the reinforcement is marked, and then if you look at the uh, above the column, you can see that there's some cracks in the reinforced concrete. They go down to about two-thirds of the depth. You also have some underneath the interior girder load, which um, is due to positive bending. By contrast, uh, the pre-stressed concrete one has no cracks in the um, positive moment region, but it does have one small crack in the negative mo moment region, which we were not expecting when we designed it, so that's one thing we reevaluated in coming up with our finalized design procedures. So if we then go to the design demands, uh, you see that the reinforced concrete cracks have grown, there's additional cracks, and there's one crack marked in red, and that's indicating that at this point, we have exceeded the AASHTO acceptable crack width limit. We have a crack in the positive moment region now on the pre-stressed one, but these are just hairline cracks. We then continued to load it to 140% ULS, and the reinforced concrete is starting to show some shear cracks, um, but the pre-stressed is not. So one of the things we did was we wanted to design this so that the cracks closed upon removal of the live load, so we did that. Um, I've actually switched to our second specimen on the right here because we didn't do uh, this, the same unload on our other one. The only difference in the pre-stress I'm showing you on this slide from the previous slide is the spacing of the reinforcement. And so 
At ULS, we've got some small hairline width cracks in the pre-stressed concrete one um, and much wider cracks in the reinforced concrete. When we unload, which is shown in the bottom row, you still have a measurable width in the reinforced concrete cracks. They are on the order of 0 0.002 inches to 0 0.1 inches. And the only reason we knew where the cracks were had been on the pre-stressed one was because we had drawn next to it in a Sharpie. Otherwise, we would have had no indication it was there. So um, that design philosophy was working. Um, in the interest of time, I'll uh, just kind of put all three of these up. These are when we then tried to load beyond our original uh, intended capacity in each region. And you can see that the reinforced concrete on the right has significant shear and flexure cracking and the pre-stressed concrete does not develop any of that diagonal shear cracking as we see in the reinforced concrete. So here are images at failure. The left is the reinforced concrete, right is the pre-stressed again. The top one is a far away shot. This is from the opposite side of the, the maps I've been showing, so it looks flipped, but then the bottom is a close up. So when the reinforced concrete failed, we had crushing along this diagonal strut, strut between the interior girder and the column um, and then on the pre-stressed, uh, it didn't fail there. It failed in the shorter region between the exterior girder and our inflection point shear. But it took a lot of help by applying additional axial load that would not be seen in a typical bent in order to get that to fail in that, that manner. So we did look at the impact of the shear reinforcement. I'm focusing this presentation on the flexure reinforcement, but I do want to point out that for the, when we modified the shear reinforcement, we really didn't get much difference between the two, um, the two performances. So the left has 12-inch spacing, the right has 24-inch spacing. Just as a reference, if you did this design with Ashto, Ashto would tell you to have a spacing of 11.5 inches. Uh, so we went a little bit bigger on that on our, on our baseline specimen. But the crack pattern is essentially the same. It's a little more chaotic. Uh, less clean on the, the larger spacing were cracks, and those cracks were right, wider. So overall, the total crack width was about the same. It was just more well distributed when we had the higher amount of shear reinforcement. So no impact on the failure uh, between those two specimens. So our, our full recommended design procedure is step one, determine the number of strands for the dead load. Uh, and then determine the minimum concrete uh, compressive uh, strength to hit our stress limits. Um, and then we did specify a minimum of uh, 5 KSI concrete and an upper bound of 8.5. That upper bound of 8.5 was chosen just because that was the upper uh, limit TxDOT was comfortable designing these for. So we set that as that. Then uh, you, uh, we did checks on the ultimate strength capacity, ensuring the minimum number of strands was provided so that the cracking moment wasn't um, greater than the, um, the strength, uh, but always check that, so it was just a, a formality. Now, we did get cracking that was a little bit sooner than we expected in our experimental tests. So we went back and we looked at, well, when did those cracks initiate and what was the associated um, stress? And we kind of took an average from that. And um, Ashto says for a moderate exposure, your uh, tensile stress should not exceed uh, 0.19 times square root of F prime C. Um, and then for severe, that's going to be smaller. But we were designing for moderate environments. From our experimental tests, we uh, got that it was a lower bound of 0 0.126, so about two-thirds of that for what we saw in our full-scale tests. And so we made this recommendation to TxDOT that if you really want to improve uh, the performance of your bent caps, use this lower um, strength or, or this lower tensile stress limit, and you can hopefully avoid cracking um, at service entirely. So we applied that to TxDOT standard bridges. If you're not familiar with the Texas Department of Transportation, they have a huge web page of standard bridge designs uh, ranging from 28 to 40-something feet wide and different lengths, uh, and these are available. So we looked at all of these, and so there was two different sizes of bent caps. We looked at 3.5 foot square and 4 foot square. That's depending on the size of the girders. And when we applied this philosophy of 
design your, your bent cap for zero tension under dead load and then get your concrete strength. When we had short to moderate spans, we were ending up with a fairly small number of strands, any 24, depending on how long the, and wide the bridge was. Um, but most of the time, that minimum concrete stress was controlling, and that's even when we use those enhanced limits to eliminate cracking altogether. So this was found to be very effective. When we got to some of the wider bridges and long, longer spans on the order of 140 feet, then we started having to go back and uh, increase the number of strands so that we met the, the stress limit even just based on the AASHTO guidelines. I want to show a quick example and I'll, 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 I'll uh, do a little less detail on some of these because we're up against the clock here. But we did, it, we did a series of examples and if you're interested in more uh, information of these, we have a report published with six different design examples that you can see fully worked out uh, for different situations. But we looked at a four-lane bridge with six columns. This is 100-foot uh, spans. This is based on TxDOT standard designs. Uh, we did the dead load strands. I'm showing you the two cross sections here because we design for a concentric layout that's more efficient most of the time. The region is going to control because you've got that void from the pocket. Um, and so what we recommend is using the net section, including the steel for that, uh, that, that pocket pipe. It's out against the AASHTO stress limits. It's uh, much lower than that. Uh, but then we said, okay, we're much lower than the limits. Is this the right way to be doing these designs? And so we said, well, can we take this six-column configuration that meets what TxDOT does now and go to four columns uh, so that we can reduce the number of column lines we have to build in the bridge? Uh, and you could not consider doing this because if you did with reinforced concrete, because if you did this uh, under dead load, you would have some significant cracking in the four-column configuration. But with pre-stressed, uh, we can make this practical. So if we applied our recommended design procedure, uh, the short story is that that was not the most efficient way to approach this design um, if we've got these much larger negative demands. So we ended up do, having to do uh, a, a more unique design procedure. Well, not unique, but uh, we just used a Magnell diagram and came up with a design four strands with a little bit of eccentricity because we've got uh, much larger negative demands than positive demands, uh, and we were able to meet these stress limits. Um, and so there's a comparison of the designs. So you're practically doubling the number of strands you have, but in the grand scheme of things, this is 54 uh, point, 0 0.6 inch diameter strands in a four foot square bent cap, so it's still fairly low on the amount of pre-stressing on there, and it did affect the shear reinforcement we needed to design for, but not significantly. So, summary of experimental findings, the reinforced concrete versus the pre-stress. The pre-stress did, in fact, delay the cracking as we expected and improved by closing those cracks under removal of the, the loads. Um, there was not a significant impact from the uh, modification of the shear reinforcement. Um, and then there's a summary of our design recommendations. For typical bents, we recommend the design pre procedure based on selecting strands based on no tension under dead load. Uh, but if you want to push the limits with your design um, and, say, reduce the number of column lines in a bridge, um, then the service limits and the strength limits are likely to control your design. So acknowledgments, we had great input from TxDOT. We had great support from Bear Concrete Works in San Antonio and locally Martin and we had a great group of students who built this and helped get it tested.